We are in the midst of a series that we have begun uh, several weeks ago in the book of Proverbs, and we're studying godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. And so I'm going to continue on that. We had a little bit of break uh, last Sunday because we had Easter, and we had great Easter service, great Easter weekend, and celebrating Jesus. And we're going to continue that celebration, so to speak, by exalting his word and really learning what God wants to share with us and say to us today. And so how many of you brought your Bible or you have an electronic device where you can get onto a program and, and get the scripture? Great. Why don't you go to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 11 and verse 12 there in just a moment. As we consider our topic, um, godly versus worldly wisdom, you know, some of you may be joining for the very first time. You might not even be sure what that concept actually means. But when we talk about worldly wisdom, we're talking about what it says in the Bible from James 3, that wisdom that is sensual, it has to do with our fleshly passions, that wisdom that is earthly, is temporal, it only deals with you know, life here on earth pretty much, and then it's demonic, that means it's deceptive and it is destructive. Versus godly wisdom, which is pure, it means it's spiritual, which is eternal, and it's, it's heavenly, and it's also just godly. It, it, it gives us life and it gives us peace. And that's what we want. We want God's wisdom versus worldly wisdom. So having said that, um, we are going to talk about something that I've kind of had in my heart here for a while and it, and it just got really confirmed, so to speak, when Pastor Harrison was speaking a few Sundays ago. He was talking about um, five things that godly wisdom does not do. And on his fifth and final point, he actually uh, spoke from Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12, where we're going to jump off uh, from in a minute. And he made a couple of statements. The first statement he made is this, is that the wisdom of this age despises correction and despises discipline. And he says, and if you don't believe me, ask anyone who's teaching someone who's 25 years or younger, 25 years old or younger. And, and that just kind of jumped up in my heart because God had dropped something in me for today and it just bore witness with me and I want to continue on that thought, particularly that thought that the wisdom that we have in this age, it despises correction, it despises discipline. And discipline is so important, we're going to learn about that in just a moment. Now. Um, as I consider that you may be taking notes, I want to give you a title and a, and a direction where we're going to go today. Would that be okay? Yeah. Are you guys ready for the word this morning? Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, we're going to talk about godly wisdom for bringing up children. Godly wisdom for bringing up children. This, this isn't a message that I was like really praying and fasting and seeking God for like, Lord, what do you want me to say? As I feel like it just got dropped in me. And then I started studying, of course. But this is something that I just feel is going to be helpful for us. God loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you. And God loves your kids. And God loves young people. And he loves little children. How many of you have ever been over to Building C where our children are? Isn't it amazing? I mean, isn't it amazing? It's, 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 it was part of the vision of Pastor Bayless and Janet to have a world-class children's ministry, and that is what we have over there. Why? Because we value children, we value family, we value people, because God does. And so we're going to talk about this now. As we talk about this idea of parenting, bringing up children, I understand that some of you aren't parenting any longer. Your, your children are older, they're adults, and they're on their own. You may have grandchildren, that's wonderful. And so um, there's probably parents here who are parenting some young adults who are still with them. There are probably some parents here you're parenting um, teens or preteens, could be parenting elementary or toddler age children. And some of you are doing this as a single parent. And to you, we say grace be upon you and God bless you, strengthen you, provide for you and empower you for what you're doing. Some of you are, are, are uh, parenting multiple generations. You've got toddlers, you got some young adults, you have some teens, and you're just, you're just spinning plates. And um, 
And so I'm definitely not going to be able to cover every single thing that could be covered from God's word to cover all that you may need, but I trust that today what we share can be helpful in some respect into what you're doing as a parent. And if you're not a parent right now, then this is gonna be something that will be helpful for you. How many of you know it's better to know how to change a tire before you get a flat tire? <laughs> and so this is gonna help you. And if you say, well, I'm past parenting and I don't really need this, then maybe you can take some of the information and share it with somebody else and be a blessing to them. And so, having said that, let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. It says these words, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So what we see immediately from this verse is that the chastening of the Lord is equivalent to his correction. They're the one and the same thing. It's his discipline. And we also see from this particular verse that the motive of God's discipline, correction, chastening for you and I is love. There's no other reason except love. And then God goes on further in verse 12, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So he takes his heart and shows us that, hey, I love you. I'm going to chasten you. I'm going to correct you because I love you. So love is, is, is something that has discipline with it. So it's, it's interesting because we could think that love would suggest it doesn't have discipline. In other words, since I love you, I want you to feel so good that I'm never going to discipline you or talk to you about something that you might be doing wrong or a direction of your conduct that is in the wrong way. Is everybody still with me so far? So love has discipline to it. Matter of fact, let's just say that. Everybody say love has discipline. So it is a display, a personal display of God's love for you. Hebrews chapter 12 of these same uh, verses that we just read here also go on to say that if there is no discipline from God to you, you are not his. How many of you have ever been out in public and you've seen some children acting up or being disrespectful to their parents? I'm expecting every hand to go up here if I live in the same world that you live in. And there, there, there have been times when I've seen it and inside of me is fingernails on a chalkboard. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I want to do something. I want to say something, but they're not my kids. So I don't have the right and I don't have the authority to say anything because they're not mine. But if they were mine, I could say something. When you're God's, he says something because he loves you, loves you. Now, the motive, just so we're clear before we go any further, the motive of discipline is love. The motive of discipline is love. From the worldly side of wisdom, it may not be love. But in God's kingdom, it is love. It comes from a place that is good. Discipline does not come out of anger and frustration and you're embarrassing me. And it doesn't come from, I'm just so tired. I just got home. I just put my keys down. Be quiet, I said. Be quiet. It doesn't come from this place of just fatigue. Discipline comes from a place of love. And let me just say on this point right here, parents, if ever we're disciplining our children, let us find ourselves in a place where we know from within we're coming from a place of love. Can that, is that okay? Because it's easy for any one of us to be upset, not even at our kids. We could be upset about how the day went at work. We could be upset about something that we just have been mulling over that's been bothering us, and all of a sudden we take it out on our kids, and that's not what God is trying to teach us today. So the motive of all discipline is love. Now, let's go to Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. And I want to read that verse to you. Now, this verse is applicable in the kingdom of God for anyone and everyone who would serve or have some kind of influence on children or young people, teenagers, 
around that, that, that age group. Um, this really applies there. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Can we read that together, please? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So that means there is a way that a child should go. There is a way that that child should go, not only when they are younger, but when they get older in life. So your part of your role and responsibility as a parent is to train your child, not train somebody else's child. Train your children. Now, this applies, again, in the kingdom across the board to anyone who has voice and influence with children, but primarily, 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 it applies to the parents. Train up a child in the way he should go. And so training means that's what you're, that's what you're supposed to do, parent. Can I say this to you? It, 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 it doesn't say schools train your children in the way they should go. It doesn't say society and culture train your children. It doesn't say social media platforms train children. It doesn't, it doesn't even say, keep listening, it doesn't even say church train children. This is the role and responsibility of parents. You say, why? Because you had that child. That child is your responsibility. Through your actions of love, and through your actions, a child was born. That child did not request to come from heaven into earth. You brought that child here by the, the sovereignty of God. That child came through you. That is now your child. That is the only thing you actually have here on earth. All your material stuff, anybody can have that. That's going to go into the trash. The only thing you have is your children. And so... It is your job, your responsibility, not your job, it is your joy and responsibility to train them up. Parents are to train their children. We don't want children training parents. We don't want children training parents. So when a child is falling out continually and you don't know what to do, when a child embarrasses you in public to where you just grab their hand and try to get out of, you know, public view, perhaps that child might be training you. I have a friend, and he's a great, great um, basketball coach, but he's really called just to work with young people. I've, I've witnessed his ministry over decades, and he does a phenomenal job. But he was coaching a team, and he had a star player. And this player was great, but he had rules that if you don't get it done in the classroom and have a certain level of GPA, you're not going to play. And this young man didn't make the cut. His GPA was below what it was supposed to be. And so, therefore, he didn't get to play. And the young man's dad, you know, blew up on the coach, but it was a young man who was also kind of having a temper tantrum as well because he didn't get to play. So what ended up happening is he left the school and he went to another school. Was there proper parent training in that capacity? No, no, it wasn't. We have the NCAA um, co collegiate basketball finals going on right now. There's a star player on one of the teams, women's teams, great, great player. And, and they showed a clip on TV, and I, I saw this. It was just very interesting because she was complaining over a call that a referee had made. She didn't agree with it, and she was just, just storming around and complaining. And they showed a, a close-up on her dad, and her dad said, Stop complaining. We need that. So where does all this begin for us? Okay, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> it starts with modeling. It starts with modeling. As a parent, you are a model to your children. Your children look to you. UCLA professor Dr. Albert Morabian taught us that we learn more visually than we do auditorily. We learn 55% of what we learn by seeing, by watching. 
And so kids are like little sponges. They, they, they soak in your words. They, they soak in your, your, your experiences. They, they soak in your actions. They're soaking in all the time, and they're learning by what they see. So as parents, we have to model. And when I say model, I'm not just talking for the smaller ones only. I'm talking about for those preteens. I'm talking about for those teens. And I'm talking about for those young adults and beyond. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you're a parent, you're a parent for the rest of your life. It would seem incongruent and inconsistent to only model a certain kind of lifestyle for the first 20 years of their life and then go off the rails for the next 20 years. No, once you have done the covenant act of sexual intercourse that produces a living soul who will spend eternity somewhere, you are a parent. You are no longer on the sidelines on the bench. You're now in the game. And whether you feel you're sufficiently ready for it mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it's, it's kind of almost too late. You're in it now. And there is help and there are resources for you and we want to help you succeed so they can succeed, but you're in it now. You can't run away from it. You are a parent. And we have to be models. We have to model what it looks like to follow Jesus. Train up a child in the way he should go, in the way he should go. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to train our children and model for them what it looks like to follow Jesus. So there was a, a, a family. They went to go and dedicate their baby boy, and they had another little boy. Their little boy was in the back seat of the car on the way home, and he was just crying. <laughs> Dad is saying, what is wrong with you? Kept asking him three times, what is wrong? What's going on? And the little boy said, well, the preacher said that we should be raised up in a Christian home, and I don't want to leave you and mom. Ephesians 6 and 1 tells us that parents are the representatives of the Lord. We represent the Lord, Jesus Christ, God the Father, to our children. We're not perfect, but we are those who are supposed to represent him to them. They should see and hear some Jesus coming out of your life and my life. Ephesians 5 and 1 from the Amplify says, Therefore be imitators of God, copy him, follow his example, as well-beloved children imitate their father. Several years ago, Pastor Bayless did an anonymous survey with hundreds of teenagers here at the church. He presented five statements to which at the end he left blank so the teenagers could fill it in. One statement read this, I wish my parents would... And then there was a blank there. And they filled in the blank. I wish my parents would be an example. These are teenagers. I wish my parents would be an example and not just tell me to do something and then they go and do the opposite. I want my parents to be an example. This is coming from the heart of a teenager, friend. Imagine, see, we think because they're kids, they don't see. And they don't really have a voice to say, but they just kind of hold it and they just keep watching. They just keep watching the movie of their parents, modeling Jesus or not modeling Jesus. And then when they get to a point where they can voice it, they may say it. Apparently in this survey, I don't know if they had told their parents, but Pastor Billis was able to be a go-between and share with parents in order to help parents realize this is very important to your kids. You got to model it. It's not good for us to say one thing and profess one thing and then live diametrically opposed to our profession. So we got to model it. We have to model it. So when it comes to, again, training up a child, it's not only modeling, but we have a mission. Everybody say, I have a mission. The mission is training. We got to train our children to become more like Jesus. That's the mission. 
to train them to become more like Jesus, to train them to become more like Jesus. That is our mission. We want to see them improve. We want to see them grow in their character and become that little, become that young man, become that young woman, and ultimately an older adult who follows Jesus, who loves Jesus and is going in his way. See, discipline and, and, and this idea of, of training them is about them becoming more like Christ. The more they become more like Christ, the more they become truly who Christ has made them to be. I, I, don't, I don't want my kids, per se, to be like me. I want them to become more like Jesus. But as parents, we can say, follow or imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, if they imitate the things of Christ they see in me, see in me then praise God. That's going to work because that's eternal information. And that's what we want for our children. That's what we want for our grandchildren. God even says to us in Hebrews 12 and 11, I'm just going to kind of give you the, the overlay of the verse. He's helping us to see that when we respond to his discipline, is so that we can partake of his holiness and that we can, in our life, yield this peaceable fruit of righteousness. God only wants good for us. He only wants good for our children. Now, the word train from the original language speaks of two particular areas. It means to dedicate and to devote to a deity, meaning to God, but it also means to train spiritually or religiously, and it also means to train morally. So we have to train our children in the word of God. I love it in our baby dedications here at church. And if you haven't dedicated your small child, your baby, or your small children, then please go on our website and look up when our next one is and be sure to dedicate your child unto the Lord. That's part, that's where training also begins, dedicating your child to God. Put your child back into the hands that gave you that child. This is important. This is important because those hands can keep your child when you're not around. Those hands will protect your child when you're not around. Do you remember the words of Jesus when he hung on the cross? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Why? Because he knew the Father was going to hold and keep whatever he committed to him. Whatever you commit to God, God will keep and God will hold. It doesn't matter who wants to take it away from you. They can't. So dedicate your children unto the Lord, but also teach them about the God of the Bible. Friend, what's happening in the day and time and culture that we're living in is that people are trying to diminish the Word of God in its relevancy and its life-giving power. They're trying to say the Bible is archaic. The Bible is outdated. The ideas are outdated. That is all not true. It's not true, friend. You take... Have you, ever, have you ever worn a shirt and it has a thread that's loose? Anybody, that ever happened to anybody? It has a thread, and if you keep pulling the thread and keep walking away, what happens to that shirt? It starts to come apart, starts to come unravel. This, friend, is the thread of life. You can't pull this out without stuff coming unraveled. And as we look around, Things are coming unraveled. When I look on the news and I see a bunch of young people at the Pike in Long Beach in handcuffs going into police cars, that's telling me things are coming unraveled. When I see young people going into Ross store, it's a store here in California if you're not from here, Ross and marshals and they're, they're snatching stuff and walking out and nobody is doing anything, snatch and grab is happening over and over again, I'm concerned. I'm concerned for us as a society. I'm concerned for us as a people. I'm concerned for our young people because this is not the way of God for them. Y'all are firing me up today. We train them spiritually. We train them morally. I saw a post from a 
a guy I've known for a very, very long time, he put it on social media. He said, I was raised to treat the janitor with the same respect as the CEO. That is good training and our children need it. Can, let me just say this to you before I go on and I have quite a bit to cover and God help me to get it all in. But with adults, I don't know if you ever had a miscommunication with an adult. I don't know if you ever had a misunderstanding spouse to spouse. Probably not, you guys, because you guys, you know, y'all have wings. Probably not. And I wonder why certain employers have HR people. Wonder why that occurs. Because we're adults. We've been trained, we've gone to school, we have education, we have degrees, we have our diplomas on the wall. So that means that we don't have any issues and we all see eye to eye and we can resolve any problem that comes our way. So if we can't do it perfectly as adults, what makes you think a child has an iota of an idea? How to live life, how to function in relationships in a healthy way how to deal with rejection. How do they know if parents don't tell them? So there are some methods in which we can train our children. Everybody smile at me. You guys still love me? Okay, I appreciate you. Thank you. Let's look at Proverbs 29, verse number 15. Proverbs 29, verse number 15. The scripture says this. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. That means a child without the rod and rebuke is a child left to himself, which brings shame to his mother, not only his mother, but also his father. And this same verse in the Amplify says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left undisciplined brings his mother to shame. Now, it says the rod and reproof equals, the rod plus reproof equals wisdom. Not just the rod by itself, not just reproof by itself. It is both of them joined together, which equals wisdom. Wisdom, the Bible says, is the principal thing. We want our children to be wise. We want our grandchildren to be wise. That's what we want. And so it's important then to understand a few methods of training. One is the rod, the other is reproof. What are the methods of training? Only people over here responded. Okay. Don't have me reprove you now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's talk about the rod first. Now, let me say this too before I get into the rod part and what that means. Um, okay, what is a rod? Who is Rod? <laughs> so the Rod has to do with correction. There's a term in the book of Proverbs called the Rod of Correction. It is for discipline. And some of you are still wondering, what am I talking about? I'm talking about spanking. This is what it says in the Bible. We still okay? Y'all still listening? Okay, this is the same Bible that has by his stripes you're healed in it. This is the same Bible that says, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Same Bible, same Bible, same author. Now, when we talk about Rod and this idea of spanking, I have to say this, let me preface. I understand that all of us have had different experiences growing up when it comes to this idea of spanking. Some things were way extreme. And some of you may have felt like, man, I was abused. And so I understand that. I understand that that has created something within you perhaps to where you thought, it may not even be good for me to spank my kids. I'm not going to do to me what my parents did to me. I'm not going to do to my children what my parents did to me. 
I understand your perspective based on your experience. However, what I'm presenting to you is let us take a moment and put our experiences over here just for a second and let us go to the eternal, life-giving, changing, powerful Word of God. Because God has something to say about this, and we don't want to miss it. Who do you know who has more children than God? I didn't hear you. Who? Nobody. Okay. So let's consider these verses. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. That's strong language. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly or early. Proverbs, 3, Proverbs 23, 13, 14. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with the rod, if you spank him, he will not die. You shall beat him with the rod and deliver his soul from hell. These are strong statements, friend. See, it says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. If that rod of correction is not applied, that foolishness continues to fester and to grow and be a part of bad decision-making choices that young adults and adults make. Can I share even a, a further insight on that one verse before we move on? Is that okay? Okay. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Foolishness is. Foolishness is. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. God said that. It made me think of another verse in Psalm 14 where it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In the original translation in Psalm 14, verse number one, the words there and is are not there. So it says, the fool has said in his heart, no, God. So if foolishness remains, what are we teaching our children? Could it be that we're teaching them to say no to God? This is not a side issue, my friend, if you're a parent. This is something that we must consider. It's in the scripture. There is uh, an article that used to come out in the paper. I'm not even sure if this, this kind of article still occurs from Dear Abby. Anybody ever read Dear Abby or heard of Dear Abby or aware of Dear Abby? Nobody in this whole section. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't know, we, we know each other, we, we like each other. I don't know why when I talk to you guys, you don't respond. I don't, I don't understand. But anyway, dear Abby, you know, she's, she had a, a little column and she would take in people's problems and situations and then kind of respond to them. And so there was one that was entitled, Mom Spares the Rod and Earns Child's Contempt. Dear Abby, my problem is my mother. She's too lenient. After she gets angry and punishes me, she often will apologize. Why should she when I have the punishment coming? Signed, Mixed Up in Cleveland. Dear Mixed Up, your mother, like many others, fears you will love her less because she has punished you. She's wrong. No child has ever resented punishment he knew he had coming. Discipline is proof of love. Children know this. I wish more parents did. What do you discipline your children for? Let me, let me just say what the goal of discipline is. The goal in disciplining your children is to help them obey quickly and quietly. Quickly and quietly. Why? Because you're their parent. You're God's representative to them. And the one you represent has a purpose, has a calling has a destiny for their life, and he's going to speak to them about that, and he wants them to be able to listen to him and obey him quickly and quietly. So you training your children this way, that's the goal. It's really training them for their walk with God for the 70, 80 plus years they're gonna be here on planet Earth. We, we, we discipline our kids when they willfully disobey us. Willful disobedience. They just 
adamant, they go the wrong direction. We say, okay, it's time to go right, and they just go left, and they know they're supposed to go right. They've been told before we're going to go right, but they go left. That's that foolishness, this saying no. It not only says no to God, it says no to you. And there's something that God has given us to deal with that in our children. Another reason why you might spank your child, besides willful disobedience, which is a sin of commission, is for not doing what they knew they were supposed to do. For not doing what they knew they knew they were supposed to do. That's a sin of omission. And that requires a response of a spanking. So let's talk about how you discipline your kids. I'm going to give you eight things, and I'm going to go through them somewhat quickly, and I, I want to encourage you, listen to this message again, because this is one of those messages where you got to sit and think about it. This is one of those messages where you may have to talk to your, your spouse about it, or if you're a single parent and you're co-parenting, you might have to talk to the co-parent together and see what is the best thing God has for our kids and how do we need to, to share this responsibility of training our child. So when you how, do you, how do you discipline your child? Number one, go to a private place. Go to a private place. Don't need to embarrass them in public. This protects their dignity when you go to a private place. Number two, let them know why they're being disciplined. Let them know why they're being disciplined. If you're upset, if you're frustrated, you're just having a bad day, and all of a sudden you want to just discipline them, and there's really no reason except you're feeling a certain kind of way, that's not a reason to discipline them if they didn't do anything wrong. We're about giving life. We're not trying to hurt our children. Our children are our greatest possession and treasure. So let them know why they're being disciplined. Let me just say this to you. If your child honestly doesn't know when you talk to them, when they, if they honestly didn't know and they didn't understand, then please don't discipline them because they didn't know. Knowledge was not present for them to have made that choice where they actually knew, so discipline is not required. Number three, let them know they made a wrong choice. We don't have bad boys and girls, right? I was hoping for a better uh, response on that. Okay? We don't tell our sons, you're a bad boy. We don't tell our daughters, you're a bad girl. No, never. Capital N-E-V-E-R, never, never. We don't never say you're bad, because they're not. And if you ever heard that growing up, you remember how that made you feel. And so we don't want to perpetuate something that we know is not godly wisdom. Godly wisdom says you're a good girl, you're a good boy, but you made a wrong choice, and choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. Number four, assure them of your love. Let them know you love them. You love them. Sweetheart, I love you. My little dude, I love you, man. But I'm your dad, and I got to do this. See, here's the thing, man. I say this, I'm going to interject this thought real quick. When you're a parent, your goal is not to be the friend of your child. That's not your goal. Your goal is to raise them up not try to be their friend. Assure them of your love. Number five, use the rod on them. This is what a rubber meets the road. Use the rod. So when I became a parent, I didn't, I knew that I wasn't going to bring some of my experiences into my parenting experience. And, and in other words, I wasn't going to bring what happened to me. I wasn't going to replicate how I was disciplined into what I was going to do to my children as a parent. So I did a full study on it. And I found out and discovered by studying the rod in the original language is, is something wooden. It's separate. And I can see the wisdom of God in that because your hand is supposed to be there to caress, to lift, to comfort and care. The same hand that cares is not supposed to be the same one that administers correction and discipline. And I can see the wisdom of God so clearly in that he gives us a different thing to use for that purpose. Now, let me say this as well. When you administer the rod of correction, which I found out is something wooden, so we use a little ruler, that's what we used, you do it on the part of your child that has the most cushion. Yeah. 
Was that clear? <laughs> Does anybody know, understand what I just said? <laughs> so to be clear, we never hit in the arm. We never, capital N-E-V-E-R, never, 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 never on the back. Nuh-uh. Right? Right around here. Okay? Just keep it right here. <laughs> Stay right. That's why God gave, well, at least I think my theology, I think that's why God gave a little extra besides sitting down comfortably. I think that could be part of that purpose of a little extra padding. That's just me. One or two swats, never more than three, one or two. Normally it happens at one. And let me say this too. This doesn't mean that you're always spanking your kids every single day, every single week. I was talking to a gentleman in between this service and last. He said he got spanked once in his life and it set him straight. Sometimes all you need. Now, and some of you have kids, and you say, well, they're just so tender and so sweet, and I look at them and they start crying. Okay, good. Work with that. <laughs> I mean, we're not saying do something that's not necessitated. If it's necessary, then God says, here's my wisdom on it, do this. But if you look at your child, and they see that, that stare, and then they... You won. You just won. <laughs> you just won. <laughs> but if you do administer the correction, then when they're crying, the next thing you do is you hold them. And you comfort them. You let them, you let them cry out those tears. That's OK. Just cry it out. Just cry it out. And then once you have comforted them, the next thing you do is you pray with them. You pray with him. You pray a prayer of repentance. My wife, Angel, and I try to be very intentional when we talk to our girls in this segment of, of, of discipline and use the word sin. Because the scripture says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. So that means to disobey your parents is wrong. That's sin. Let them hear that word and let them understand there is a consequence to sin. You can't just do stuff that's wrong and then nothing happen. Like some of our young people, as I mentioned, who are going into stores, taking merchandise and walking out, nothing is happening. What is that telling them? I can do whatever I want to and that's not the right mindset to live in this world. You can't do whatever you want. Freedom has boundaries. And then the last thing is tell them you forgive them and that God forgives them. Tell them you forgive them. I forgive you. God forgives you. We're good. And then don't bring it up. When Angel and I would do this, this would take us about 45 minutes each time. And it wasn't this thing that we did every week and every month, but it was just, it took a long time. And I'm, if I'm keeping it real with you, I'm be honest. There was times where I didn't feel like doing it. I mean, and I think that can be a reality sometimes with parents. You're like, I got to do something. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to get it over as quick as I can. But there's so much that's being missed. The comfort part, the explanation part, the teaching part is being missed. And our kids need that. Our young people need that in order to grow up in the way they should go. So... The reproof part, and I'm just gonna tell you this very quickly, reproof is verbal correction. It's just helping them understand, okay, what you did was wrong. And there's consequences to what you did. It's a clear statement of what is wrong and why it was wrong. And a warning not to do it again. It's wrong. This is why it was wrong. Baby, don't do that again. Okay, don't play with a knife with your brother or your sister. That's dangerous. 
That's dangerous. So reprove them. So today, as I come to a quick conclusion, we talked about the motive of bringing up our children, which is love. We've talked about the mission, which is to help them become more like Jesus. We talked about the fact we need to be a model. We talked about the mission, and we talked about some methods. Gave you eight things there so that you can be effective in training your children. I want to pray for parents right now. I'm going to ask you all to stand, please. Parents, only parents stand. If you're not a parent or parenting currently, then please, you can stay seated and just kind of rest. <clears throat> but if you are parenting currently, even if it's your grandchildren or if you're a legal guardian and you're parenting, stand up. I'm going to pray for you, and I want to ask a special thing. If you're a single parent, raise your hand. I want those, okay, hold your hand up there for a minute because I want someone who's sitting down to put a, a hand on the shoulder of those single parents. I want those single parents to feel supported. I don't want single parents to feel like I'm alone. You're doing the work of two adults. Good Lord, we're going to pray for you. And I don't mean that in a joking way. We're going to pray for you. Parenting is hard work, but we're called to it. We're mandated to do it. God gives us grace that we might carry it out. It's, it's hard work, but thank you, Jesus. It is rewarding. It really is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for all of these men and women who are standing up in this sanctuary outside, and even if you're at home, stand up now in the presence of God. Stand, who are standing up, Lord, who are looking to you. We lift up our heart and our eyes unto the hills because our help comes from you. Father, I pray first and foremost for them for healing in their own hearts because I know, Lord, there were some things that may have been said or done or some things not said or done that have affected us as we've grown up into adults. We've seen some of the gaps. We've seen some of the unhealthy social interactions that we've experienced in relationships, and we've wondered why. But Father, we ask for healing. We pray that you would make complete what has been incomplete by your grace and by the truth of your word. We ask you, Father, for wisdom and discernment for all these precious parents, Father. Help them to discern who their child is and who you're calling their child to be. Father, in the scriptures, you would tell parents about the future of that child. You told Mary and Joseph about Jesus. You told um, Samuel's mother, Hannah, about him. You told others, Father, other parents. You told John the Baptist's parents about him and what he would do. God, we ask you for insight into our children that would help us and aid us in raising them according to your word. Father, I pray that you would give each parent insight. Help them, Lord, to understand the best way to speak to their child based on their child's personality. Father, I pray that you would strengthen every single parent with spiritual might and strength in their inner man. Strengthen them in their mind, Lord, because I sense even now there are some that are just so tired. They're doing this by themselves, and they have a lot of small ones right now, and they're, they're just always tired and always worrying about finances, Father, and always just thinking about, I wish I had more help and I need more help. And God, they're just overwhelmed. I pray that you would remove that overwhelming feeling from them and set them on a rock that is higher than their circumstances. Give them a peace that passes all understanding with that strength. And Lord, in the midst of it, I pray you would give them a supernatural joy. Whenever they look at their child, whenever they think of their child, a smile would rise up in their heart. And they would see the blessing this child is in their life. And if they're dealing with strong-willed children or children who've been getting in trouble, God, I pray they would not lose hope. They would stay in the parenting role and not give up or quit and let the child go on his own way. I pray they would stay engaged, Father. And then lastly, Lord, we pray for a spirit of humility to rest on them. Humility that would ask for help. Humility that would confide in someone else 
so they can help pray for them and for their children. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.